Everything Action presents Envision USA by Jason Frost Chapter 4 The cab driver pulled up to the curb, crunching the empty beer cans, plastic big back curtains, and the rest of the garbage jammed against the curb. He snapped the meter flag off and turned around to face his fare. Once again, he looked admiringly at the tall man's expensive gray suit, obviously hand-tailored, the shiny maroon tie, gleaming white shirt, and gold tie pin. You sure this is the place you want? the cabbie asked. This is the Ponce de Leon Hotel, no? Rostov said in Spanish. See, si, this is what you asked for. You wish me to wait? No. How much do I owe you? Seven dollars and fifty cents. Rostov handed him a ten dollar bill. Keep it. Thank you, senor. Rostov climbed out of the cab, clutching a duffel bag in his left hand, and looked up at the Ponce de Leon Hotel. Perhaps once, forty or fifty years ago, it had been a show place, the hotel to stay in while visiting Miami or to meet that special someone for a high-class rendezvous. Not any more. Not looked as if it had been dipped in grime, rolled in grease, then dropped back on this block from a great height. The whole building seemed to lean to the right. Rostov walked into the lobby. The carpeting was colorless, but not odorless, the stench of something rotting mixed with stale cigarette smoke and a bitter underlying smell of urine. The hotel manager looked up from his chair behind the counter. He was 20 pounds lighter than skinny, wearing a white golf shirt buttoned up to his scrawny neck. He munched on peanut butter and cheese crackers, licking some orange crumbs from his fingers. You lost, pal? Rostov walked past him. Thank you, but I can find nice to myself. Yeah, right. If not, we got plenty of people in this place who will help you find it. He snored loudly at his joke and bit into another cracker. Rostov looked at the rickety elevator and decided to take the stairs instead. It was only four flights. In Moscow, he had to climb six flights most days because the elevator in his apartment building was always breaking down. The people he passed on the stairs always looked at the double bag first their dim eyes brightening at the possibilities of what might be inside and what it might mean for them. Then they looked at the man, Rostov, and wondered why such an obviously well-off and handsome gentleman was strolling through the Ponce de Leon Hotel with a duffel bag. That's when their eyes would dim again, squint into their normal cynical sneer. They'd seen all kinds down here. Probably had some leather outfit in the bag, chains, a cattle prod. They'd shrug knowingly and move on. Rostov reached the fourth floor just as the door burst open and a chubby bald man ran out. A naked Latin girl, maybe 17, stood in the doorway and threw a shoe at him. From behind, she complained in Spanish, that is ten dollars extra. Bullshit, the fat man drawled, jamming a cowboy hat on his bald head. Where I come from, it doesn't matter which door you go in, the price is the same. He spun around and bumped into the Rostov. Watch it, partner, he said and started to pass by. Rostov grabbed the man by the throat with a pincer hold, his thumb and fingers almost meeting behind the fat man's jugular. He felt the man's pulse thrumping wildly beneath the fingertips as he shoved him against the wall. When Rostov spoke, his voice was calm, but the fiery eyes displayed a terrible anger. You must be more careful to watch where you are going. The fat man gagged and clawed at Rostov's powerful grip. Rostov snapped his wrist, and the fat man's eyes rolled up in his head, and he dropped up to the floor unconscious. Rostov absently tugged at the cuff of his left sleeve and continued down the hall, ignoring the naked young girl standing unashamed in the doorway. As soon as Rostov passed her door, the naked girl dashed out, went through the fat cowboy's pockets, emptied his wallet of cash and credit cards, and hurried back into her room, bolting the door behind her. Rostov knocked at room 412. Yeah? The voice inside called in an unfriendly tone. Special delivery, Rostov said. The door opened and three burly men stood in the doorway with guns. One of them was black, the other two were white. None weighed less than 200 pounds, none was older than 22. That you, buddy? The voice that behind them that called? Let them in, guys. Get the fucking shoe on the road. The three men stepped aside and allowed Rostov to enter. Rostov took in the room without seeming to even notice it. He noted exits, how many feet to the windows, the location of the bathroom. If asked, he could have sat down and drawn a blueprint of the room as exact as the original architects. Mickey Seidman was lying down on the bed, his shoes and socks off, an elegant dressed woman rubbing his feet. Mickey was dressed casually, blue crew neck shirt, Pleated gabardine pants, beige shoes, nubby cotton sports jacket, diamond stud in his left ear lobe. Rostov calculated that the outfit was worth a little more than a thousand dollars. Mickey was only twenty-three years old. Sit down, man, Mickey gestured at the other twin bed. This here is Tina. How do you do, Rostov said, sitting. The woman looked up. Despite her expensive and useful clothing, Rostov could see the slight signs of age on her face beneath the makeup. She was probably thirty-five or so. She was also stoned. Dig this man, Mickey said, sitting up. I've been doing this shit for a few years now, making a fuck a lot of money, buying the fancy clothes and cars and all that kind of shit. Thing is, man, I get other, together with the other assholes with money, you know, socializing stuff. 
Only these other guys that see, well, they got their money more and more or less legit. Fucking the people who buy their products rather than the junkies and hoods we, de we deal with. Only difference I can figure out is that they can advertise on the goddamn Tonight Show, and I can't. I mean, picture old Johnny Carson holding up a baggie of blow, taking a snort in the air and saying, Best shit I ever had? Ross, I've looked at his watch. Can we conduct our business now? Yeah, yeah, right. Thing is, I figure, hey, I gotta live with these rich assholes now. Fucking their daughters and such, so I might as well learn how to talk with the old farts. So I start taking, like, evening classes at the continuing college, English and stuff, taking here with my teacher. Tina smiled, and then dropped the smiles as she couldn't remember what was so funny in the first place. So it turns out, Tina here has been living the goody-goody Catholic life her whole fucking life, and is ready for a little walk on the wild side. A month later, she's sucking off every guy in here and snorting a hundred bucks a day. You dig it? Hell, she even do you right now if you whip it out. Right, hun? Tina smiled. Yeah, sure. Maybe later, Rustav unzipped the double bag and pulled out a bag of cocaine. He handed it to Mickey. Mickey pulled out a black telephone in his lap and dialed. The other party answered immediately. Yeah, man, it's me. Put the foreign dude on the phone. Pause. Yeah, he's right here. Hold on. Mickey handed Ross out the receiver. You're by. Ross is smoking to the phone. Nico? Yes, everything is here okay. Do they have all the we weapons? The grenades? Good. How many crates? Yes, that's enough. What about the rocket launchers and the plastic explosives? He listened and nodded and turned to Mickey. You are two crates short of Uzis. Mickey shrugged. My supplier jerked me off, man. I made it up for it with an extra case of bazookas. Russ has spoken to the phone. Did you hear that? Yes. That will do. He handed the phone back to Mickey. Nico, baby, put Banning back on. Banning? Hold on. Mickey snapped his fingers at the three hulking bodyguards. Okay, guys, everything's cool. Go wait in the hall. Keep an eye out for cops. The three men left. Mickey tore open the bag, dipped his fingers in, and tasted the powder. He smiled and sang, Rock and roll is here to stay. It will never die. Quickly, he jumped to his feet, grabbed the mirror from the dresser, dumped some cocaine from the bag onto it, and handed the whole thing to Tina. Go for it, babe. Tina rooted through her purse, pulled a gold razor blade and straw. She tucked her baby fine blonde hair behind her ears and leaned over the mirror. With the concentration of a diamond cutter, she separated a six-inch line from the pile. The lining of her right nostril was raw and sore, so she stuck the golden straw into her left nostril and pinched the other right one closed with her thumb. She inhaled, following the line of coke like an aardvark right tracing a line of ants. Mickey spoke into the phone. Yeah, it's good. Then I have the weapons. He hung up and held out his hand to Rostov. Pleasure doing business with you, man. Rostov smiled. The pleasure is all mine. His right hand lashed out, his open palm striking Tina on the back of her head, driving the little straw up her nose. Mickey! She screamed, listening her head. The straw st stuck out of the end of her nose, blood falling down and streaming out the end of it as if it were a faucet. Not giving Mickey a chance to react, Rostov grabbed him by the throat and ran him up against the wall with a loud thud. Mickey sagged slightly, dazed. The door began to open. Rostov yanked the forty-five from Mickey's belt and fired five shots through the door. Slowly the door swung open to reveal one of Mickey's bodyguards slumped on the other side, his big fist still clutching the doorknob. The other two bodyguards were sprawling a bleeding heap behind him. Mickey revived long, long enough to start struggling, prying at Rostov's fingers, chopping at his gun. Rostov smiled again. Perhaps you want your gun back? He jammed the forty-five back into Mickey's belt and fired three times down into his crotch. Mickey's eyes went wild with agony. And the lids closed and the body went limp. Rostov released his grip and Mickey crumpled to the floor, dead. Tina was screaming frantically now, flapping her arms disorientedly. She managed to yank the golden straw free from her nostril, but the blood continued to pour down her lips, mouth, and chin. Silly woman, Rostov said, clucking his tongue. He grabbed a handful of her hair, hurled her forward through the dirty window. Glass exploded outward, and the jagged edges still stuck in the window raked her body as she shelled through, screaming as she plummeted to the sidewalk. Rostov calmly surveyed his work, nodded with satisfaction. He tugged on his rough sleeve, stepped over the bodies of Mickey's bodyguards, and walked out of the room. A breeze swept through the broken window and swirled the cocaine across the floor like so much chalk dust. Mikhail Rostov was drenched with sweat. He heard a whimpering sound, but was only vaguely aware that it was came from him. His body felt as if it were encased in a tight rubber suit that kept shrinking. His limbs were numb, sweat hot as boiling water, sizzling across his skin like butter in a skillet. It was the same nightmare, the same one, over and over, the one about Matt Hunter. Africa. A new nation whose name was bigger than the country. The last stop for the U.S. Secretary of State on an anti-apartheid mission. It was a last-minute decision, the President ordering Secretary Jennings to pay a personal visit to the alien Prime Minister, Bawana. KGB had found out about the plans at great cost and immediately contacted Rostov. Documents were fabricated, confessions prepared, 
evidence arranged. Secretary James Jeff would be blamed on South African black rebels. The anti-apartheid cause would be set back another decade. The strife and violence would continue, and with the United States keeping its distance after Secretary James' assassination, Moscow would have an easier time increasing its influence. The plan would work, as it had so often in so many other countries. African security had been laughable. Not long out of the jungles and the sway of Christian missionaries, the enemies were still sloppy, too trusting. Rostov would need to kill only three men, boys really, due to the Prime Minister's palace. Blood from one disemboweled slung soldier's freckled his boot. He wiped it off on the back of his leg and continued down the palace hallway, the green duffel bag slung over his soldier. He was climbing the wide marble stairway just as Secretary Jennings' motorcade arrived. There was much shouting and cheering outside. The Star Spangled Banner was played on traditional African instruments. From his perch on the balcony, Rostov could see the large door where Secretary Jennings would soon be entering the palace. Servants aligned themselves on both sides of the door and stood at attention. The head servant fussed and fluttered about them, straightening their ties, brushing lint from the shoulders. Four purely decorative guards stood at attention, armed with only the traditional spears that the Magumba tribe had used to drive out their rivals two centuries ago. The front door opened and Secretary Jennings and Prime Minister Bawana entered. The excited cheers of the crowd washing up around them. They turned, waved one last time as the doors were closed. When the door slammed shut, the Prime Minister sagged slightly, the effects of his age, 83, and illness playing on his face. Secretary Jennings offered the Prime Minister's arm for support, but Wanda smiled gratefully and took it. How sweet, Rostov thought as he unzipped his duffel bag in the dark recess of the balcony. It took him only seconds to remove and set up his M47 Dragon Medium anti-tank assault weapon. They're not as effective or as portable as other MAWs or LAWs, like the arm burst disposable, the M47 Dragon had been specifically chosen because a shipment had been stolen from the manufacturer, McDonnell Douglas Corporation in St. Louis. The ammunition had been stolen from Raytheon Company in Bristol, Tennessee. Clues had been left identifying the anti apartheid rebels as the thieves. But the Dragon would do its job. Outfitted with 60 side thruster solid propellant motors, Seclos guidance, thermal 390W battery, and a roll reference gyro, the Dragon could penetrate three feet of concrete. Secretary Jennings and Prime Minister Bawana were coming straight toward Rostov now. Rostov checked his watch, right on time. Of all his skills in assassination, torture, military coup, Rostov was most proud of his timing. He planned everything to the second. His black Swiss watch was his one extravagance. It had cost more than some small automobiles, but it had been with him on a hundred missions and never missed a second. Now, with no exception, the watch said it was time to fire within ten seconds. Ten seconds. A lifetime of the two men down there. Rostov shouldered the dragon and sighted Secretary Jennings through the X-6 scope of the tracker. All Rostov had to do was fire the missile, and afterwards keep the tracker crossers on Secretary Jennings' chest. An infrared detector in the tracker would pick up a signal from the IR transmitter in the tail of the missile, and the thrusters would adjust automatically to hit whatever the tracker was focused on. It couldn't miss. Rostov thumbed aside the safety. He squinted into the telescope. Senator Secretary Jennings and Prime Minister Buona were laughing at something. Rostov grinned, held his breath, and slowly began to tighten the trigger grip. Suddenly he felt a like cold, hard metal thump against his ear. He carefully lowered the maw. He said the name before he even looked back. Hunter. Aw, oh, you ruined the surprise. Rostov heard a turn, but Hunter jammed the muzzle of his forty five into Rostov's ear. Shh. They waited like that until Senator Jennings and Prime Minister Bawana and their entourage had passed. When they finally were alone, Rostov turned with a snarl. You must not. Rostov shoved the gun into Rostov's ear, ripping skin. I said to be quiet. Maybe I could clean some of that ear axe out of you, Rostov. He thumbed back the hammer with his gun. The click echoed loudly in Rostov's ear. He felt himself trembling, his bladder swelling. He had no choice but to try escape. Foolishly, he grabbed at Hunter's gun. Immediately, Hunter sized up the attempt and swung his elbow into Rostov's nose. Blood squirted out each nostril as the Russian fell back to the floor. Hunter leaped on top of his chest, straddling him and pressing the gun against his broken nose, leaning into it a little. Hunter chuckled, but it was not an amused sound. It was more like a growl. My order said to bring you back alive. Since the boys behind the desk think you, they can swap you for one of ours, I say any deal that lets you live is a lousy one. I intend to kill you anyway. Hunter's blue eyes seemed paler, almost gray. Rostov didn't move. When I think about our guy's wife and daughter waiting for him to come back, you know what sentimental guy I am. Rostov nodded. He had seen the damage Hunter could do. He had seen impenetrable buildings looted of secret papers, piled of the bodies left behind. All the work of one man, Hunter, the man with no past. 
Hunter shifted his gun to his left hand and pulled a thick combat knife from his boot. I want you to remember this moment, Rostov, and since I don't have a camera, I'll have to improvise. He pulled Rostov's left arm away from his body and pinned it to the floor with his knee. He pulled up his sleeve, revealing Rostov's prized watch. Rostov began to struggle, and Hunter whipped the pistol across his broken nose. Rostov stopped struggling. Hunter stabbed the blade straight into the watch, shattering the crystal in the works. With a deft flip of his blade, he slipped off the watch band. Slowly, deliberately, he pressed the sharp blade against Rostov's wrist until blood swelled up around the shiny metal. He plowed the knife through his skin. You bastard, Rostov said. I've always had trouble making new friends. When Hunter was finished, he wiped his blade in Rostov's hair and stuck it back into his boot. From now on, every time you check your watch, you know what time it is, Rostov. Time to die. Rostov looked at the back of his wrist, saw a large bloody H carved there. But it wasn't just blood seeping out of the wound. There was something else. Something moving. The wound, then the wound peeled open and hundreds of white maggots emerged, crawling out of his wrist, over his arm, leaving a slimy trail of blood as he covered his arm. He screamed, as always, and as always he bolted up to, in his bed. The door to his room opened and Nico and Kurt burst in, guns at the ready. The dream? Nico asked. Rostov stared at his wrist before answering. He saw the big white H, each line of the scar like a fat worm lying on its, on its skin. Sweat beaded all around the scar. Rostov rubbed his wrist, tucked down the, the sleeve of his pajama shirt. Yes, the dream. Rostov reached over to the bedside table and grabbed the bottle of vodka. He took a long, deep swig. The dream was coming more often now, almost every night. Sometimes it even came during the day, while he was awake. He could never get a good night's sleep, never really rest. The scar on his wrist was like a tattoo. Another man's initial on his skin. This could not be tolerated. He took another swig of vodka. It didn't help. Nothing did. Tomorrow, he said. Tomorrow we kill Hunter. Nico bristled. Tomorrow we begin the main mission operation. Hunter first. It would mean coming out in the open. He would be risking everything. Rostov rubbed his wrist. The sweat evaporating from his body chilled him. We kill Hunter, then finish the operation. He's one man, not even an agent anymore. He can do nothing. You know him only by reputation. I have seen his work. Nico shook his head. McCall, please, you are obsessed. Rostov threw the bottle of vodka across the room. It smashed into the wall. It will be done. At home, they will not tolerate it. They will have to, won't they? Nico did not answer. He and Kurt left the room. Rostov leaned back against his pillow. He did not close his eyes for fear of the nightmare would return, but he didn't mind. By tomorrow, Hunter would be dead, and with him, the dream.